morning, and welcome to worship with the First United Church of Christ Congregational in Milford, Connecticut, where we are united in essential faith in God and God's love made known through Jesus Christ. For families with children and youth, you can still register your child for our online Sunday school by contacting Kelsey DiCarlo, our faith formation minister, or by emailing or calling the church office. Sessions take place on Sunday mornings at 9.30. Tonight, both Confirmation 1 and 2 and our youth groups are meeting. Please contact Kelsey or me for more details. On October the 4th, in addition to our regular online 10 a.m. worship, we have a special outdoor, strategically spaced World Communion Sunday opportunity. There are about 10 stations interesting for any age, planned for 30 minutes to go through this moving worship on the Plymouth Lawn. Arrive anytime between 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Near the end, you can even partake in communion with bread and juice from individual sealed containers. Thank you to our deacons and worship leaders for helping us offer this. Starting October the 4th, our virtual coffee hour will center on discussions of different essential faith vocabulary. First, we'll discuss what creation means to us. Carol LeBrake is organizing a community-wide church tag sale for Saturday, October the 24th in our church parking lot. The event will abide by safety guidelines of the health department and invites people to rent parking spaces to sell their own items. See the website for details. Today's worship theme is In Essentials, Unity. Two ways to take this theme with you include the United Church of Christ's handout on being a civil voice in uncivil times. See the link in the description. The other activity is to participate in listening training that Reverend Tammy is leading every other Wednesday starting September the 30th at 7 p.m. See our church website for more details. Today, our new series, Take Care, Stewardship as Faith Essential, begins. Stewardship is the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. God has given us so many gifts and entrusted us to take care of and to be good stewards of our bodies, the environment, talents, relationships, time, and money. At 11.45 a.m., Stewardship Ministry will host a Zoom discussion on our relationship with our money and what it means to us. How do we take care of our money? We look forward to the enriching take care opportunities ahead and to explore questions with Nina, Will, Steve, Michelle, Ed, and Scott at 10.45 a.m. The link is in the description. Now, let us greet someone near to us or online with a sign of God's uniting peace. Join me in the call to worship. Watch and listen for the word wonders of our God. Our God is among us. Watch and listen for the goodness of our God. Our God moves among us. Watch and listen for God is here. Our God dwells among us. Let us now sing the opening hymn, God reigns o'er all the earth.
God reigns o'er all the earth, green hills and valleys low, the farms and towns in golds and browns, God's grace and beauty show. God reigns o'er all the earth, sown banks and spreading plains, in the rainbow hues, reds, yellows, country lands. God reigns o'er human life through youth and aging years. In death and birth, in grief, in birth, in all our hopes and fears. God reigns o'er human life, our inspiration still. Schemes in all our dreams, we see God's reigning will. Please join me in the opening prayer. God the encourager, God the compassionate, God the merciful, holy, blessed, disturb us, rouse us from our sleep, lift us into consciousness of your presence. Change us, move us, mold us for the better, so that at the sound of your voice and the call of our name, we will never be the same. May this worship do this and so much more. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Whether you are young or young at heart, I would invite you to join me for this children's message today. This year, we are spending some time thinking about what is essential in our faith. What do we need? Now, I know what we want, or at least I know what I want. I would love to have all of you here in the building with me so we could worship together. I want to have Sunday school in person and be able to high five all of you. And those wants are real. But I want you to think a little bit deeper with me. We're talking about what do we need. We need the tools to continue learning. Things like our Bibles and opportunities. We need opportunities to explore these things like online Bible studies and Sunday school. We need ways to pray and to worship God. And yes, there are absolutely other needs beyond these. Today, I want to read to you part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. And this version is actually from the Common English Bible, which is different from the Bible you're probably reading at home. Okay. You are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. God calls us to shine our faith for others, to show our community what it means to follow Jesus. We need to share our faith. There's so many ways that we can do that, by doing things that we need, like joining in Sunday school and online Bible studies and music projects and things like that. There are other ways too, though. We can send a card to a neighbor. When the leaves fall, you can rake a neighbor's lawn. You can attend a worship service, either online like right now, or on the back Plymouth lawn at 8 a.m. 
participating in these things like youth group, these are all ways that we can share our faith. They're all ways that we can engage with our community. It's easy to feel isolated right now, but God calls us to be in this sacred community together, to shine our lights. We need our community. We don't just want it, we need it. And I think God sees that need. So now I would invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious God, we have hidden our light. We have put it under a basket. Help us commit to being part of your great community, shining our faith for others. Amen. Through the church, we unite in faith and in ministries to serve God. Alone, we never could teach, feed, heal, guide, comfort, challenge, speak out, or praise you in the ways we do together. Our essential unity relies on essential generosity. We invite you to give to the church's mission. You can give offerings and pledges online at firstchurchofmilford.org or by mailing a check to the church. Before the Pilgrim Chorale does this special virtual anthem, I want to just give you a few things to think about about this piece. It's called My Lighthouse by the Wren Collective. And it's all about how God is our lighthouse when we're trying to steer our ship to shore in stormy seas. What could be a better metaphor for the time that we're in now when we're just struggling to find our way through these crazy times and to remember that just like those great lighthouses, which is such a New England image as any, those great lighthouses, God is our lighthouse to get us through these tough times. So may God be your lighthouse. Enjoy.
Join me in our prayer of dedication found in your online bulletins. These gifts represent the best of ourselves, O oh God. We attest with joy that we can do no better. Receive them with our prayers. Take and use them for your goodness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now let us sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. reading comes from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And from Matthew's Gospel, we read in chapter 21, When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? They argued with one another. If we say from heaven, Jesus will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. The word of the Lord. Great. Let us join our hearts in a spirit of prayer. God, unite us by your word in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There is a classic church saying, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. 
The quotation originates from Peter Meidelin, a German theologian writing about around uh, 1627. Ten years earlier, a Catholic King Ferdinand had been installed in the region. Protestants said that Ferdinand was intolerant of them. For instance, he had stopped the building of many Protestant churches in the area. In 1618, some Protestant leaders hosted some Catholic leaders at a castle in Prague. When the disagreement escalated, the Protestants took three of the Catholic leaders and threw them out of a third floor window 70 feet up in what is called the Third Defenestration of Prague. The three Catholic leaders somehow survived the fall. The Catholics claimed that angels caught them. The Protestants claimed that the Catholics landed in a pile of manure. Regardless, it helped incite the Thirty Years' War, where Protestant city-states and Catholic ones ruthlessly fought each other, with eight million deaths as a result. So when Meidelin wrote, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things charity, he wasn't being Pollyannish. He was seeking to be a genuine peacemaker during one of the most devastating wars in history. Building a window to envision unity, freedom, and love where people would not hate or kill each other. I look at our society today, with the pandemic, our civil unrest, political division and antagonism, some people predicting apocalypse after the election, and wonder if the same prescription might help us from the brink, from metaphorically or literally throwing each other out of third floor windows. Now, one of the most difficult situations that I hear people find themselves in is when they feel like they are forced to choose a side. Some people ask me, does it either have to be for black lives or blue lives, for or against life, for or against choice? In our gospel reading today, Jesus is asked a question by his enemies that is intended to trap him. By what authority are you doing these things, this ministry of yours? And who gave you this authority? Jesus knows that any answer will upset some of the leaders. So Jesus flips the dilemma back on the chief priests and the elders. I'll answer your question if you answer my question first. Where does John the Baptist's authority come from? Human or divine? The priests and the elders huddle up. Saying divine authority won't work because then we'll look silly for opposing John the Baptist. But if we say human authority, this will upset all the John fanboys out there. So instead, they say that they can't give an answer. By doing so, the priests and the elders admit that what people say and write have consequences. We can't always make everybody happy. People make calculations about their choices and their opinions, sometimes politically motivated. They might take a side out of principle or in order to whip up a base or to upset folks on the other side of the aisle. But as Christians in a political landscape filled with landmines and open third floor windows, let's consider what it really means to be united in essentials, to have liberty in non-essentials, and charity in all things. Let's start with the last of those three prescriptions. In all things, charity. Charity here doesn't mean just dropping off, used clothes at the goodwill. Instead, it means actions of loving kindness. In Christian faith, we base such kindness on Jesus' commandment to love God and neighbor, and elsewhere where Jesus says to love even your enemies. To love is to honor the fullness of worth that is bestowed upon people and creation by God. Notice that the saying doesn't suggest charity sometimes or loving kindness when it's convenient or self-serving. No, charity in all things at all times. This part of the saying is a guardrail for us from recklessness and especially from dehumanizing other people, from throwing another person's human value out the window in order to feel tough about ourselves. So if I consider, for example, sharing or commenting on a meme that demeans a person wholesale or cast dispersions across entire groups of people, or if I feel on the tip of my tongue words that will hurt a person's feelings gratuitously, projecting my anger upon them, 
like calling someone stupid? What violence is that doing to the person that I denigrate, to our community's bonds, and to myself? There are other ways of expressing ourselves that should be able to honor our values and the fullness of all people. If there is not a respectful way of expressing ourselves, then what does that say about our perspective? When it comes to being a Christian, in all things, charity. Now going backwards, the second Christian prescription is in non-essentials, liberty. Now there are plenty of non-essential choices or states of being out there that we get to have as Christians. For example, what baseball team, if any, we root for is a non-essential, right? So far, nobody has run me out of the church for being a Chicago Cubs fan. I have the liberty to do so. What Bible translation you prefer? Not essential. Having communion in church on the first Sunday of the month? Well, here it's predictable, but it's not essential. Our ethnic or racial background, our orientation or our gender expression? Well, those are essential to who we are, but they are not essential in the sense that we need to all share the same qualities or states of being. We can love each other across non-essential differences and affirm each other's liberty. Now, the non-essential waters get a little bit muddier with issues that we care deeply about and that have apparently big impacts on the world. Does someone try to recycle and keep their carbon footprint small? Or do they throw everything away and not worry about how much fossil fuel they use? Some people may say that's essential, and others say not. So what is it? Or within certain reasonable boundaries, is backing a, polit a particular political party or candidate in itself essential or non-essential? Of course, we all believe that we are right in any political opinions we may have, and that more people should share our views. It helps if we can articulate our political views or any kind of views with honest faith language. This church, however, does not and cannot demand political unity. I do not believe that God is blue, red, green, or independent, or gives only one person the right to govern. Making a god from politics and ideology is idolatry. Or as Sufjan Stevens writes, God has no political boundary. God is love, period. God is universal, with no allegiance to anything other than love. What then is really essential and requires unity? Well, Meidelin pointed out that the essential thing that unified people across the battle lines during the Thirty Years' War was their Christian faith itself. Catholics and Protestants both follow Jesus, he basically said. Consider that for a moment before you resume killing each other. From Philippians, we read earlier, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. The essential unity being expressed here is partially one of belief, being of one mind and of one spirit. But even more than that, it emphasizes unity of Christian practice, compassion, sympathy, humility, seeking the interests of others, love. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Don't just believe in Christ together. Be like Christ together. Which brings us back to the charity in all things. Charity in all things is itself essential to our unity. During our open and affirming discernment, and now as we live out our open and affirming covenant, I have discovered that there are two levels to being an open and affirming congregation. 
The first level is to proclaim that we affirm people of all identities and backgrounds. It is a belief shared of loving kindness. But the second and just as essential level is keeping each other accountable to embody that promise. That means that we must both affirm all people and speak the truth in love when someone stumbles in our journey of humble loving kindness. It means to call someone out with love when you or I do or say something that denigrates or dehumanizes someone. And to do so for the sake of the maligned person and also in tough love to the maligner. And to admit that we all fail in following Christ. We can only live in essential unity if we maintain graceful engagement if we keep each other lovingly accountable to our covenants, which are reflections of Christ's covenant with us in love. So yes, we might at some later moment want to defenestrate our neighbor. We might disagree with someone about issues about race. We might be impatient through November and perhaps even into December when the general election will be worked and litigated out. But remember now that we are accountable to one another to live out that essential unity of loving kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let us join our hearts in the spirit of prayer. God of all people, you have shown us what it means to live in faith, to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with you. You call us to walk humbly with each other as well, O oh God. Forgive us when we get puffed up with pride or a false sense of superiority. Forgive us when our political desires sweep aside our sense of decency and respect. Heal us through your word and through the work of our community, diverse and yet united in love that comes from you and love that we return to you and that we share with our neighbors. We pray, O oh God, for our country. We care deeply about values in our nation of justice and freedom, of respect and intrinsic value, of work ethic. Help us to care about all those things, but also about your grace and your love for all your people. We pray for our leaders and also for all the voters who invest their trust in our democratic republic to become a more perfect union, even as we recognize that our government is always fallible. This week, O oh God, we pray for right paths and the legal process surrounding Breonna Taylor's death in Louisville. We pray for those who are impacted by the wildfires out west. We give thanks for birthdays such as that of Dorothy Monagle. We give thanks for wedding anniversaries, like the 48th wedding anniversary of Bill and Sue Roots. Bless their family and their covenant of love for one another. Oh God, so much of our creation suffers, including many of your children. We name now some who hurt in body or in spirit. Mike, Abigail, Justin, Stan, Jim, Susan, Bill, Sue. If it is your will, grant them your healing presence. We pray now for the souls of those who have recently died, as we name some now. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. O oh God, receive them in your mercy and grant hope to those who mourn. O oh God, called as partners in Christ's service and to ministries of grace, you make us accountable to one another and stewards of the gifts of time and love that make life so amazing. And so we give thanks to you always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank our God for sisters, brothers, one by grace in harmony, joining heart to heart with others, making strong community. With the cross of Christ our standard, let us sing as with one voice, Laudy, Laudy, yours the promise, we who are the church rejoice. Holy is your name forever, ye divisions that remain. Bless the church's new endeavors, make our witness one again. One in Christ and one Christ's gospel, make us one we now implore. Glory, glory, yours the glory, then and now and evermore. And now for the benediction. Now may we be united in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, both now and forevermore. Amen.